Yeah, my name is uh, Ben van der Pluim. I'm a geologist at the University of Michigan. I've been there for a while since the uh, mid 80s. But it uh, worked uh, and I still work in the area of research wise a lot in structure and tectonics. Um, but uh, I've also uh, done a lot of work uh, over the years in um, uh, global environmental change and in particular in sustainability. One of the things that I did uh, that's relevant to the journal for sure was that I was uh, uh, I was in, in charge of the uh, Global Change Program at the University of Michigan, which is a teaching environment to learn about environmental change. I uh, did that for about uh, oh, 15 years. Um, and um, now, of course, everybody talks about sustainability, but in those days, that was a new term. Uh, that, uh, my colleagues uh, I did it as an interdisciplinary group of people. So my background is, is a range from, uh, from classical geology uh, using, you know, and see uh, mass spectrometers and the like, of course, as anybody else does. But um, um, and uh, the the understanding environmental change uh, based on scientific principles. So Earth Future was designed and planned by AGU Council, and um, they already had decided to do that journal, um, and they simply were looking for uh, an editor who was um, willing and perhaps able to take that journal to the market and see whether we could make this uh, a, uh, a, new, um, a new part of the AGU publication portfolio. So I did not design the original um, uh, idea of the journal, but being the first uh, ed editor when the journal was out, I of course I had the, the chance to design really what we're doing with the journal, what we're putting into the journal. And so uh, Guy Brasseur was, I think, the architect at the early stages of, uh, the, the, of, of the journal. I think he also came up with a name, but um, I was the first editor who was starting to um, uh, deal with the, trying to stock the journal with uh, interesting papers. The uh, the first challenge and perhaps the most daunting one as I was thinking about your journal was the fact that it's an open access journal. And even though we talk a lot about open access, the, the culture in the United States has not been very strong when it came to open access. Moreover, even within AGU, open access uh, was and still is somewhat of a rarity. Um, and so having a journal whereby we now expect the authors to follow the rules of open access um, was the biggest concern that I had. And it, that actually played out as a concern, but with the good news here was that here's where the US is a little slow. Uh, Europe, for example, and, and, and Oceania, uh, places like that already had open access as a requirement for federally funded research. And so uh, the opportunity of, of getting good work in was not limited by open access after a few years. The second challenge is, is, is just predictable. You throw a new journal on the market, who knows that it's there and who knows where it would be going. And so why would you submit there? So we did, um, uh, and Guy was very helpful in that, but the entire editorial team, I was lucky to have uh, an editorial team of rather strong, um, uh, opinionated, but also very informed colleagues. And so we were starting to talk with our, our, our colleagues and see what we could actually generate some interest. And um, the challenge was not small. In the first couple of years, the, uh, the pickings were slim, um, but it picked up because we were uh, lucky getting a bunch of really good publications and submissions or first and then publications that made us visible. Um, and that's how we mounted that challenge. The other thing that, that I did, which I spent a lot of time on myself, which I felt was probably the, the way to make the journal more visible, was that I use social media um, in, in the sense I had Facebook um, and stuff like that. But really what I did with social media, I actually connected with, um, with, uh, um, um, with people that did social media. So in other words, I, I pushed out the information to people that might then in turn share the stuff that we had. And we were also very lucky with support we got from, from authors, uh, their institutions and the AGU about connecting with journalists. And the material in Earth's future is very suitable for a broader consumption. And so we saw in the, after a couple of years, quite a few of our papers appeared 
outside the regular realm of uh, publication, meaning in the uh, broader uh, literature, in, 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 in newspapers and the like. Um, and that really built our name and, and reputation. Um, and that sort of got us after about three years or so, we started to get our footing and uh, started to get uh, many more submissions than we thought was suitable at the time uh, for the journal. I think that uh, Earth Future, just like all the other journals, has an important place for all the communities that we have in, uh, in the AGU. Uh, the only thing what sets Earth Future a bit apart was that it really didn't have yet a firm community, but it did have a lot of, of interest among the, the, the community in AGU that wanted to connect science with society. And so even though we did not have a um, seismologist or hydrologist and stuff like that, many of them were very interested in the connection of their field with society. And that's where Earth's future filled this big gap that was in, in AGU. Now, it doesn't mean that other journals were not trying to do this, but we explicitly were doing this. We explicitly wanted to see the connection between science and society. And I think that really made the journal um, uh, attractive for a certain type of paper that intends to reach a broad audience. Um, and so it, the community, of course, is big. Outreach now is, uh, this is seven years later. <laughs> everybody does outreach. Everybody talks about um, how they connect with, uh, with the public and the like, which, by the way, is still very difficult. It's one thing to say. It's not a thing to do it. But at the time, uh, we were lucky with help also from the staff at AGU to make those connections. And I think the community is just, all of us, all scientists now see the importance of, of being the relevant, or having the relevance with, uh, with society. In fact, I have annoyingly perhaps often mentioned that I felt that science felt they were above many of these conversations. And, and other than the climate people who were always concerned about what society decisions are made, many other fields were really not all that interested or all that uh, available to have this conversation. I think that that, that field, of course, has changed now radically. Uh, all of us realize that uh, we have an important voice and our voice as scientists needs to be heard in decision making and that's what Earth Future tried to uh, help with. So one of the things the journal explicitly was looking for was the relevance of the science for short-term and long-term decision making. So that we felt that we have to deliver science in a way that obviously is scientifically rigorous but also can see application and has meaning for the political system where ultimately the decisions are being made. And many of those decision makers are not scientists, and that's a euphemism in some ways, it's underplaying it. Most, if not nearly all of them are not scientists. And so it was our job to be better at sharing our insights. And I think one of the values of, of our future um, was as we started it and has been over the years and will continue to do so is that it really makes all the authors aware that what they say and, and what they write really should be having an impact on how we plan the, the, the near and maybe even uh, the, the far distant future. So the value sits in, in the application um, of, of the science that, that's, uh, that, we, uh, that we present in the journal. So it's an interesting question, of course, to ask first editor what the future of a journal is. Uh, I am not that future, <laughs> uh, but uh, uh, what my bigger concern was really, would there be a future for Earth's future uh, when I was in, in, in that position? Because I, I, I saw uh, the challenges um, as, as we started. In about after three or four years, I found that we were on very strong footing. We really saw that there is a, a, an important place for this um, a type of science reporting that also has uh, application. Um, I think that um, has been always the plan in some ways, but nobody knew what that should look like. It was an idea, but it wasn't really uh, executed. Uh, I think we uh, have been able to do that. And of course, I am not the editor in chief anymore. And so I don't know what the plans are with the journal in, in, in the longer term. But I think uh, uh, in 10 years from now, uh, we will see that, this, that science hopefully has regained much more of its relevance into the general public's thinking. And uh, with today's health crisis, 
it's all the more again evidence where science needs to do a really strong job to make sure we are heard but also respected in what we say they're being heard and i think the journal presented material that was really um had great depth and, and you could not sort of it's not easy opinions so i always said we want you to write the papers and you may have an opinion but the opinion is only has a place if you can show why the science tells you this opinion is what you need to know about. But just having an opinion is not what we're after. And I think the journal's science rigor will continue. The other thing that worked out, of course, in this, uh, if you think about that, is after Earth's Future came online, we were not the only publisher that went this route. Uh, some of the well-known name journals or, 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 or publication institutions uh, have added journals along these lines. And so the competition uh, for papers, uh, for good papers, um, has grown. Uh, but I think that reflects the interest of the science community. So where it will be 10 years from now is probably different topics than we are right now in some ways, but it will be very similar. I mean, water, food, uh, atmosphere, um, hazards, those things will keep on affecting human society ever more so as population, which we also published on, as population uh, grows around the world. And as our demands for, for resources, for energy and the like, will continue to grow and whatever kind of changes we make in that arena. The, so I am the classic uh, researcher, not early career anymore, but I, my career has been what an early career sort of was 30, 35 years ago, whereby you did research with one or two people and a bunch of undergraduate undergraduates that will work with you and graduate students in particular phd students that did the heavy lifting in the research area um, what we are seeing i think is a big shift whereby scientists are part of larger teams and um, i am worried about that i am worried that the younger researchers will not be recognized in those larger groups for the simple reason that senior people are not senior because they are difficult elbowy pushing people aside but they're equally aggressive in getting their work done but they have a better connections they have a better reach and i worry about young researchers who are in these larger projects uh, where they would have an identity that we know this is what they do this is where they are coming from and not this is where they and 30 others are coming from um, so I encourage uh, uh, young researchers to uh, avoid the temptation to jump onto big projects that have a lot of visibility, but a lot of visibility for who? For the team, for the team leaders, perhaps even for the funding agencies, but the individuals would be essentially not as able to do their work. So I always would think, be part of a larger team, fine, make sure there's a path in there that identifies you and it shows where you come in. And that's an advice that I give to young faculty that I meet, that I give to graduate students that I, that I work with, is that you, you, you can't solve uh, big problems on your own, but you can solve parts of big problems on your own and in doing so develop a research enterprise that, uh, that is recognizable. And remember, there's another thing to young researchers um, uh, one way as a researcher, your success is, is measured obviously by what you what you what you do, uh, what you publish. Um, uh, the bean counting of funding is important for for some people, especially administrators. But um, uh, really, what is a hugely important part of being a researcher is to also mentor and train the next generation of researchers. And that happens as soon as you start as a researcher, because once you have a research appointment. There will be graduate students that will work with you and so you have an important mentoring role you need to give them opportunity also for them to find a path and not just be just a small wheel in this giant uh, uh, engine so um it's just a perspective that uh, that that uh, maybe makes me a little bit more different from others uh, but i've always saw great value in, in in smaller groups that talk with other smaller groups and maybe together have some solutions but not just being part of a giant organization uh, although it is tempting because uh, it, it often comes with a better support and uh, certainly with, uh, with high visibility uh, in, uh, in of the project by itself. So one of the things in the journal that uh, I did after a couple of years thinking about the journal was to realize that what we should do uh, as scientists is be a little less preachy and telling people, first of all, what to do and not doing it ourselves, 
Uh, secondly, telling people what the world will look like 30 years from now, and in particular telling people that the world will look like, um, like the Blade Runner movies. Um, I realized that what the public needs and also deserves is a better understanding of what's happening today. And so this understanding of what happened today, what happened tomorrow, when I say tomorrow, I mean tomorrow, so the next day or the next week or the next month is something that in science, we, we just basically did not put as much stock in. And so I've shifted my thinking uh, in the last uh, sort of uh, already happens after a stint at the National Science Foundation, where I worked on the sustainability program that I sort of was a large uh, research uh, support program. Um, but uh, I, I moved away from sustainability, long term arguments to shorter term uh, uh, observations that tell people what to expect in the immediate future. And that's under the, he the header of resilience. And I think resilience is probably the big topic that we should focus on. And uh, by the way, I think that will be the big topic that will start to arise, just like sustainability rose after the mid 90s, so sort of the turn of the uh, 2000s. I think that resilience, thinking about what to expect today. The fires are today, the fires will be tomorrow. Uh, what the fires will be 30 years from now in California is really not all that relevant if your house is burned down. So resilience, understanding resilience and resilience thinking, I think is the path uh, forward to connect science better with uh, society's needs.